Um, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us here at the Paul Smith Vic. I'm Natalie Thill, and I direct the Adirondack Center for Writing. If you're not familiar with the Adirondack Center for Writing, shame on you. Um, we are a non-for-profit literary organization, and we do writing programs and storytelling programs and poetry, slam, spoken word programs throughout the whole Adirondack region. But our office is newly um, located here at the VIC. Um, we're thrilled to be here, and we've been here since April. And so um, it's kind of a very important point for us as an organization. Um, it's kind of a, finally, the center part of our organization makes sense now because we really are a center. People can come and visit us and engage with us, whereas before you really could only contact us if you came to one of our programs or went to us online. Um, if you want to know more about the Adirondack Center for Writing, we, are, um, we have a website, adirondackcenterforwriting.org. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. There's really just no reason to not know everything there is about us. Um, we just finished up a fiction boot camp in Glens Falls. We have a publishing conference where we bring up major um, editors and agents from Manhattan, and they do manuscript critiques and talk about publishing. That will be September 24th in Garnet Hill in North Creek. We do a wide variety of programs. We also um, host monthly open mic programs where aspiring writers can come on up in Lake Placid, Warrensburg, and in Old Forge. So as you can tell, we're all over over the Adirondacks um, and we do a lot of different programs for writers and for readers so if you're interested in reading and you want to get more involved you want to meet the writers that um, that you admire then you know become involved with the Adirondack Center for Writing and we'll be able to uh, to marry you with your writer um, so today's program is the Native American Writer Series program that is funded. And I actually have to read this because it's really long, and I'm always afraid I'm going to forget. The funding for this program is uh, the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership through the Lake Champlain Basin Program and Quatrocentennial Legacy Program. And part of this program, as you can see, there's Joel Hurd over there um, from North Country Public Radio um, taping this. Part of this is that it's a legacy, and the, there will be videos and recordings, and each of these programs will be made available on our websites and the websites of our partners. And it's not only the lecture or the performance that is being recorded, it's also your questions. Um, so this is sort of like a time capsule of what people are thinking and how they're engaging and their ideas ideas and perceptions and questions about Native Americans living in the Lake Champlain area in the summer of 2011. And the idea is that we would be able to go back to these um, programs and listen to them and look at them 10 years from now and really see how things have changed. Um, one thing that uh, many of you, if you're from Saranac Lake, you might have noticed um, in the newspaper last gosh, it was just last Sunday, um, Doug George did a lecture for us at Fort Ticonderoga, and there he announced their hope and intention to buy Camp Gabriel's and turn that into a Native American center for culture and um, uh, study, which is a hugely exciting and fascinating prospect if, if it can happen. But I thought, geez, we have that on recording now. And if 10 years from now or 20 years from now, that's a full-fledged um, you know, degree-earning institution, you'll have the first announcement there on. on um. So you're all part of history, whether you realize it or not. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Um, the last of this series is on August 27th. We are featuring Robin Kimmerer, and she will be talking at ECHO in in um, Burlington. The whole point was to reach all the various parts of Lake Champlain region, so that's why we're also including Vermont, of course. And she's going to talk about um, traditional knowledge, um, traditional ecological knowledge, and how that has affected um, modern stewardship and restoration of the environment. Um, and she's actually exactly the kind of person that would be teaching at the facility at Camp Gabriel's if that were to um, become a reality. She marries hard science and traditional knowledge in a really fascinating blend. Um, and so she will be talking at ECHO on August 27th. All right, I'm going to do really brief intros because no one likes a long intro. Um, but I would like to introduce both Jesse and Joe Bruchak. Um, I'm going to introduce Jesse first. He's a graduate of Goddard College, where his thesis was the creation of a syllabus for teaching the Abenaki language. Um, Jesse has worked extensively over the last 15 years in projects involving the preservation of Abenaki language, music, and traditional culture. 
a musician whose specialty is the native flute. Um, he's the founder of the Don Land Singers and has performed American Indian music at festivals and in concerts throughout the United States, in Canada, and in several European nations. So we welcome Jesse and his father, Joe, um, I'm proud to say has become a friend of mine over the years. Um, do not let Joe Bruchak know your weakness because he will <laughs> play on those. I'm going to just say it out loud. I'm afraid of bats. And every time Joe sees me, there's, you know, surprisingly always a bat right over my shoulder or something like that. He's, he's really a horrible, horrible person. Um, and he will always play on your deepest, darkest fears. Um, it, it, I've introduced Joe, this is the second time now, and I, it's impossible to keep it brief, but I really have kept it brief because he's so in unbelievably prolific. He's written hundreds of books. He's traveled world over. <laughs> um, he's had um, literary awards and accolades accolades heaped upon him. So what I chose is I just chose to pull out what I felt was most pertinent to today's program. Um, but if you're not familiar with his work, please become so, because you could um, focus on very many elements to it, particularly all his books, um, to to educate yourself about a lot of things. But Joe has been most nourished by the stories and traditions of his uh, Abenaki culture, stories and traditions that he set out to share with audiences young and old through his books and storytelling. Joe has written over a 100 books, an astonishing number, more astonishing when re one reads all the starred Kirkus reviews and glowing book list reviews. He writes books for children and adults, novels, short stories, poetry, plays, and always with the foundation of Abenaki traditions as their guide. But with all great writing, readers will always discover universal truths about humanity and our connection to the earth upon which we depend, whether or not we weather we're willing to uh, acknowledge that dependence or not. So the two of them, father and son, I'm thrilled to have you both here. Thank you so much. Welcome, Jesse. Hard to follow midgets. Guai guai ni dobak. Hello, my friends. In the Louise is Souza, Bala Nokida Hozid. My name is Joseph, also the peaceful one. Ta, my son, Jesse. Guai guai. In the Louise, Jesse. Ta, on la wina metongwisida. Nekwambi and datsui, papi, nonogoni lentonganon zikia. Uh, yo lentongan uzi noat, uh, ta ida kwai kwai uzi kia, uski uh, nidombak from Yiskak. What he said is, we're not going to do a welcoming or a greeting song for you to draw you all together into the circle. Yo guanode, yo guanoda. Yo guano de yo guano da Gaio ani he ha yo yo he 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 Hey yo guano de yo guano da Hey yo guano de
One of the oldest traditions among native people is the idea of welcoming or greeting, drawing people into the circle. For in that circle, we all have a place to sit. In that circle, we're all at the same height. In that circle, we can all see the center and also look across and see each other's faces. And in that circle, everyone's place is equal and yet different. Everyone's perspective may differ from everyone else's, and yet they're all connected. So it is that around this place we call the Champlain Basin, we were all connected long ago and remain connected to this day. We tell stories and have traditions of how this place came to be, of how we lived here in relationship to the land and how that land shaped us. One of our oldest stories tells of Cruz Gomba, the one who shaped himself from the earth. In fact, we have a tale only told in the wintertime, not now, of how that lake came to be where the one who was called Ojozo rose up from the earth and shaped himself. We're going to share with you today some songs, some stories, some things that come from the long ago, and some that are not so old, some that we've created ourselves, but are also part of that continuing circle, which is both for this generation and for those who follow after us, which comes from those before us and goes on to those who are yet to come. In fact, it is sometimes said among our native people that we can look to the earth and see the faces of our children not yet born coming to us from the soil. So what we'd like to do right now is share with you the sound of another instrument. The first one you heard, of course, was the one that is the drum. Our name for that in the Abenaki language is that hollow object which is struck, uh, pako, pak is to strike, pako ligan, the drum. And that sound of the drum is the sound also of the heartbeat, that first music that everyone heard. Even before you were born, you could hear your mother's heartbeat. And so that music of life that you carry with you should always remind you, listen to your mother, and remind you too that this earth, like a mother, supports us and requires only love and respect in return. The drum is often called the heartbeat of the people. You also heard actually a second instrument, sisiwan, which is the rattle, the sizzler, which is a little bit like the sound of the, the hail or a uh, rain striking a surface. And that is a natural sound as well, a hollow object too. And the third hollow object is the one we call pekongan. Pekongan means that hollow object you blow into. Abenaki is a very descriptive language. <laughs> and the flute, we say, in many of our native traditions, came to be long, long ago when a bird made holes in the hollow branch of a cedar tree and the wind that blew over that hollow branch that was broken off at the end made a sweet sound. And that sound heard by someone, that person realized, I could take that branch and make it into a musical instrument. And so taking the branch from the tree and leaving a gift in return, some say a handful of tobacco or kinikinik was placed at the base of that tree to thank it. That person then went and tried to fashion a flute and finally guided, they say, by dreams from Kitsinoask, the great mystery, made that first flute. And the flute itself contains within it the breath of the wind, the songs of the birds, and our own breath, the gift of life shared through the cedar flute.
Kolumbia nie ibi tak lúzi anom bajovi pomgiska, ak tá nemi tonguis, klúzi iglis monivé. He's going to tell the story in Abenaki, and I'm going to tell the story in English. Noa nongonivé musbás pomosát. Long time ago, there was one known as musbás. Tá on lawi nia kedi hon agama ontloka ongan ida ho ta he. Aha, aha. When we tell the story, we want to make sure that everyone is awake and listening. That's right. So if I say ho, or he says ho, we want you all to say hey, ho? Hey. Uli igen, uli onine mitongos. Dakagui. Muspas, pomosat, spiwi gluskomba, odzi miga ka wonganao, pomola, ta kiwakwa, ta senakwa, ta mina. Musbas, uh, with his great friend, Glus Gomba, who was a great hero of our people, did many, many amazing things. They fought um, the Wind Eagle and tied his wings. They went to Chulson, the Wind Eagle. They went and uh, fought against or Pomola, actually. Pomola. Right. They also, you said Pomola. That's right. uh, they also um, defeated uh, the Stone Giant. Mm-hmm. They defeated many, many creatures and uh, did many great things. Kanwa Musbas and Da Owadzonem Awonsisak. But this one, Musbas, had a sort of a problem. There was something that uh, he did not have in his life. Um, and he wanted more than anything else. He wanted, because he saw his friends having families, and he did not have a family himself. Musbas losa... So he went directly to the home, the wigwam of his friend, Klus Komba. He scratched on the door. The wigwam, the old way we would knock, was to scratch on the bark. And he said, come in, come in, my, uh, my brother, my friend, my relative, my little son. My little son. Sorry, my little namonis. son, my nephew. Sorry, nephew. Agama. Uh, Pidiga ni we womek ta ida klus komba liula damana widzo kania nia and datsui pahanamom ta awonsi sak. So Musbas crawled into klus komba's wigwam. Ho? Hey. He said, klus komba, I want you to do something for me. Ho? Hey. I want you to help me find a wife. Klus komba monzado pikongan taolawi yo ta u milagon udzi Musbas. And Klus Gomba reached back and took out a flute and handed it to Musbas. Agama ida tsagakia pikwa yo pikwongan, ulin tongan udzi wikwi mo pahanam udzi kia, agama olawongan udzi kiak. And he said, within this flute, there are magical songs that will call to you any woman who would be willing to be your wife if she hears the song you play for them. Muspas ira o kitsi ulioni kitsi ulioni dananis ta agama losa kapiwi spiwi uski pikongan. And he said, "Great thanks." And he ran out into the forest. By the way, we should mention that in those days we didn't mention that the people and the animal 
were That's much right. the same. That's right. Back those days long ago, the animals and the people were a lot alike, and the animals and the people could speak to each other. So this is that time we're talking about. Muspas nidale kapiwi piqua uski piquongan. So Muspas lifted up that flute and he played a song. Nipikongan uli tongwa taonlawi kluskomba idap. Oh, good song, that flute that kluskomba gave to me. Ta agama in namiho, medao la squa, bumido iauda ta benihla, pasodziwi agama. And sure enough, someone came. There, flying out of the sky, came Loon Woman, who landed next to him, began to rub against his leg. Agama, um, udiksi dawi? Oh, she'd be good. She'd be a good wife. Kanwa Agama in Namito Alamo Alamo Bit Taonlawi Gui Gui Gan? But then again, she kind of waddles like a duck. So Nia on Da Ni Baongan Gui Gui Gan? How could I marry a duck? What would my friends think? Gluskomba Kwao Tam Saga Nia Piqua Piquongan Mina. Kluskomba would understand if I played the flute just one more time. Kanwa taniadozi agama piqua piquongan mina medaula squa o laongan posquinamen. Ta agama bumido o zi nibesis taonla wi yo, ta agama lo quasi yo lentongan nikwongi. And in so doing, he broke the heart of Lone Woman, who flew off and landed in the center of a big lake. To this day, you can still hear her singing that song that was played for her. But Moose Boss just went on and played again. Agamau Laudam Ulintongan Mina. He thought, whoa, that was a really good song. Agama in Nami Ho Nulka Squa Ligadahit Lagwiwi Agamak. And there came Ligadahit leaping out of the forest. Isn't that great? Ligadahit leaping. There was Nulka Squa, Dear Woman. He had won the heart of Dear Woman. Ho? Hey. Kanwa Agama Urlaudam Nia Ulilin To Papi. But he thought, you know, I'm a gifted musician. I shouldn't stop now. Who knows who might come next? I just, I'll play one more time. Agama papi mina kanwa poskunamen olaongan uzi nulkaskwa nulkaskwa ligadahit mina kapiwi. I think you know what happened. I don't have to tell you. That was a really good song, he thought. Kanwa onda in nami ho awani? But he didn't see anyone coming yet. He wondered where? Awani. Where's the one I've called? Daki awa sosqua sonko sak la guiwi agamak taon la wi and then, lumbering out of the forest, came Bear Woman. Oh, I was so squaw. Oh, Lee Pahana Momo Zinia Agama Sogolo Zit, Ta Agama Nadia Lito Zinia, Ta Agama Quildahania, see? Taolawi Quani Poke, Quani Poke Agama Nia Awazi Spiwi. 
I was so squat. And most boss thought, oh, bear woman, she could cook for me. She's a good cook. She could hunt for me. She's a great hunter. She could even fight my battles for me. She would take care of me in every way. Uh, and at the winter time, we would be warm together, Pabuniki, in her cave. What a good wife she would be. Kanwa Agama would allow them Nia Papi. But then he had this twisted thought. I'm such a gifted musician. I've called loon woman. I've called deer woman. I've called bear woman. Who knows who I might call if I played just one more time. And as he lifted that flute to his lips... Saw what he was about to do. She did not cry or run away. She just reached out her paw and squashed him underneath it. And then, when she lifted up her paw, Natami Saguasis had been squashed down and had become the first weasel. So, yeah. <laughs> and that flute had been broken by the weight of her paw, and its magic went back to Kapiwi, the trees, so, yeah. and to Kluskomba. So, yeah. And that is the end of that story of Mospas and the flute. Nialitz. Nialitz. Thank you. Yes. All right, Nick Wambi Nia Kluzi Iglis Moniwe, and I'll, I'll speak a little English now. Thank you. It's wonderful to share the Abenaki language. It's a language that was spoken here um, for many, many, many years. In fact, maybe if we have time, we'll tell you a story about um, some Abenaki people who were known by the Iroquois who also lived and hunted here as Adirondack Indians. And we'll tell you about, um, if we have time, we'll tell you about that. But uh, this is a language that I, I feel really honored to carry with me. It's wonderful to share it with you today. There are very, very few speakers, unfortunately, of Algonquin languages in general. Abenaki is an Eastern Algonquin language, and there are even fewer speakers of Eastern Algonquin. Um, the Western Abenaki dialect, which is specifically what I have learned to speak from an elder named Cecile Wawanolet. I was lucky enough to have about a decade with her. And now I'm working with her son. She passed away at 99 years old, was her first language. And it was her, um, her dream to see it continue. Um, her son and I teach the language now throughout the summer. And then we study and try and create literature in the language together throughout the winter. We have uh, probably about seven people, though, who are like Ely, people who grew up mm -hmm. speaking this as their first language. And we'll be having the Saratoga Native Festival in Saratoga Springs on October 1st and 2nd at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center. And at that festival, we'll be honoring Ely Joubert, mm -hmm. who is the son of Cecile Wawanolet, yeah. and who is one of the carriers of the language, who was born and raised in that language. I'm going to share a song with you, which is to sing for that next generation. And maybe we could um, start, and then we could jump to flute after. Or yes. Why don't we start with the flute so we're in the right key? You can start with the flute. Okay, yeah. I'll do that. This is a song which sings for that next generation, which is what we need. And we see some here in front. I have two little ones, a three-year-old and a five-year-old. My daughter is five, my son is three, and I only speak only speak the language to them, and they understand everything. My son is three, and he learned what took me 20 years to learn in the last six months. It's amazing. Uh, he says, you know, help me, Daddy, help me, when we're building the train set. Um, and their mother speaks English, so they're growing up fully bilingual. This song sings for them and all children, tutuas, uh, the little ones, the children, to grow up. Try that word, tutuas. Tutuas. And you'll hear it in the song, and you can sing that with us. And you'll also hear a chorus uh, that comes around. It sings for them to grow up straight and tall like the, like, well, here we have the whispering pines. Gigimondwak. Like the pines. Like the pines. koak would be the whispering pines. But to grow up like those great big tall pine trees, straight and tall and strong. So this song sings for those children, hopefully some of whom will be carriers of our language and our traditions, um, things that we see in all cultures are being lost nowadays at such a, such a rapid rate. So this is a song for the future.
Nonjum tak musič tu tu as. 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 Kwe ha wani yo, kwe ha wani yo, kwe ha wani yo, kwe ha wani yo, kwe wani tak music tu tu as, kwe wani tak music tu tu as, kwe wani tak music tu tu as, kwe wani tak music tu tu as. Goodness, I've been doing my deep breathing exercises. <laughs> That's a song which is also danced. And the cool thing about that song, which I love, is that it would be sung by the children, and their mothers had to dance while they sang it. So if they speed it up, their mothers had to speed up. <laughs> so it was a, a song that was very commonly done uh, up at, for example, Odenac, which is a reserve once known as St. Francis, up in the province of Quebec, one of the two Abenaki reserves in Canada. Jesse and I have been working on trying to shape the language and perform the language and also share the language in many different formats. And one is the form of poetry. If you go to his web website, which is westernabenaki.com, you'll find on it songs, stories, and poems uh, recorded. You can listen to them, but you can also read them. And we decided to put together a collection of some of the things that we've done uh, this is uh, a collection of poetry in bilingual format, with Abenaki on one side, English on the other. It's called Nisnol Siboal, which means two rivers. So Jesse will go first in English, and then I'll do exactly what he has read. In my home. Grandfather. Pomosa Spiwi Nia. Walks with me. Zompka Kapiwi. Through the forest. Tsiga in my home. When grandfather walks with me, I'm not afraid. In my home, grandfather leads me up the hill. From that hill, I see a long, long way. In my home, grandfather whispers. A song to me. It is a song. I will sing. Again and again. In my home. Grandfather. Is never far away. In my home. Grandfather. Is the wind. Was, songs are for many different purposes and used in many different ways. And you guys did such a good job singing a little bit of Tutuage. Jesse has been creating uh, new songs 
songs used to teach our language, songs especially designed for young people to sing. And when we do workshops with young people who are learning the language, it's really neat to see after the workshop, groups of them off together singing these songs, which are pretty easy and pretty catchy. So I'll let Jesse describe the first one that we're going to share with you, and then we'll try to do it together. All right, maybe we'll do the most universal thing that we all seem to need uh, is the ability to count. So I've created a song that counts 1 to 10. And like most languages, once you learn to count 1 to 10, it's pretty easy after that. There's a, there's a lot of repetition. But learning to count 1 to 10 in Abenaki can be hard, as you'll hear, because there's a lot of sounds um, that we may not have in English. The first four numbers are pretty easy. So the beginning of the song is like this. I'll sing it, and then you can try and help. The 1 through 4 goes pazuk, nis, Nas iao, and then this has no translation. We ha ha ya, we ha ho. Actually, it means we ha ha ya, we ha ho. He's correct. <laughs> so, pazuk, nis, nas iao, we ha ha ya, we ha ho. Again, pazuk, nis, nas iao, we ha ha ya, we ha ho. That's pretty Good. easy. Good. Five, oh, six, vegan. seven, eight get a little harder. But the same melody. So starting with five, it's No Lon Niguidons, Tomba Wons, In Son Zek. We hi hi ya, we ha ho. No Lon Niguidons, Tomba Wons, In Son Zek. We hi hi ya, we ha ho. Then it gets easy for nine and ten. No li we. Mdala, we hi hi ya, we hi ho. From the beginning, pazuk nis nas iao. We hi hi ya, we hi ho. No lon niguidons tomba wons in son zek. We hi hi ya, we hi ho. No li we mdala, we hi hi ya, we hi ho. Pazuk nis nasiao, we hi hi ya, we ha ho. No long ni we don't stone by wounds and so sick. We hi hi ya, we ha ho. No li we ndala, we hi hi ya, we ha ho. We get really good. It's my daughter's favorite part. She calls it the chorus. Pazuk nis nas yao no lon niguidons to my wounds and zek no liwe mdala. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> Jesse mentioned a story earlier on. Before telling the story, I should mention that uh, our family, in tracing our genealogy, we have ancestors who are Mohawks as well as ancestors who are Abenakis. In fact, we have one ancestor who uh, lived in Schenectady in the 1600s uh, named Otztok, or Snowbird, who appears to be the ancestor of almost every Mohawk person we know. <laughs> it's interesting how there were many, many people descended from this one woman uh, whose father was supposed to be a Beneke, which is another story. But because of the vagaries of history, often it is portrayed that the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, and the Abenakis are mortal enemies. And that's not necessarily true. We were neighbors. We traded with each other. We learned from each other. We shared stories with each other. We shared language with each other. And we shared more than that, because we often have common ancestors. However, what occurred is that when the Europeans came to North America, you had the French on one side, and the English on the other engaged in what was truly a world war. And it happened more often than not that the allies of the French happened to be Abenaki. The allies of the English happened to be Haudenosaunee or Iroquois. And thus there was really great conflict in that colonial period between our different nations. But even during that time, when Rogers Raid in 1759 attacked the village of St. Francis or Odenac in Canada, many of the survivors of that raid sought and were given shelter by Mohawk people. So that's a background for this story. And I think we could do this in Abenaki in English too. And it's a story of this place 
And actually, I should mention, in fact, tell them about the meaning of Saranac because we're so close to Saranac Lake. Uh, Saranac literally comes from a word that me is salon, which means sumac, and ek is the locative, so it means at the sumac, or where there are sumac trees. Sumac is also, though, an Algonquin word. It is the same word as salon, just from the Powhatan dialect. So Saranac literally is a word which means at the sumac. And if we break it down more, it actually is red berry tree. So, yep. Yeah. When you break down a word and find its actual derivation, it's so interesting to see how words come to be and places gain their names and people gain their names from events in history. So, want to begin in Abenaki or English? Mm. English, Moniway. Nda. Nda. Alnombaiwe. uh huh. So, we. Alnombaiwe idamo in the uh, normal way. Which is great, a great yeah. uh, way to see it. Yeah, Al, the, the Al right Al hand. Al is my right hand, the, the, the normal right hand. The normal right. hand. So to speak Indian is to speak the normal way. Unfortunately, to speak Abenaki is no longer all that normal. But at one time, of course, it was. So Although uh, also, Al Noba is not just normal, but humorous. Humorous a or person human. Who, who is human. A human person is able to laugh. To be humorous is to be human. To be al noba or human being is to be a person with a sense of humor. I say to my daughter all the time, al nita pita, which means you're really silly. And you hear that al at the beginning, al noba, al nita pita. Yeah, it's the same root. Noat nongoniwi, mazip squeak, nidali ombanakiak, spiwi msalkik, pomozoi noak nidali, noat. Mm -hmm. This is a story about the uh, Flintstone people, the ones we now know as the Mohawks, and the al Noba people, the ones we often refer to as the Abenaki, or the Easterners. Actually, what Abenaki means is dawn land, the people that So, Ombanakiak, Nawa, Yodali, Udzi, Nadiali. A group of, um, Wab we say Wabanaki? Wabanaki, yeah. Yeah, Sorry. Wabanaki men decided to go hunting, and so they started off in the direction of the uh, sunset to the west. Uh, Yodali um, um, Salonek Agamo in Namito um, uh, Ilakwak. But at that same time, uh, coming from the east and meeting at the place we call Saranac was an equal size, or maybe a little larger group of um, Hodenosoni young men, people from the Flint nation. Uh, Ilakwak Idamo um, Adder Snake Igloos Moniway. Iroquois. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. Iroquois. In English, uh, Iroquois actually means adder snake. Mm -hmm. Iroquois is an Abenaki word. <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> they call themselves Hodenosoni, people of the longhouse. Uh, Nidali, Salonek. Iroquois, Yodali, Ta Ombanakiak, Yodali, Ta Agamomo, Lokwazi, Pasoziwi, each other. Mm hmm. They came to uh, uh, that place between uh, Middle and Upper Saranac Lake, where there's a very narrow stretch of water. Mm -hmm. uh, the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois on one side, and the Abenakis on the other side, looking over at each other. Neither one wanted to be the first to try to cross and perhaps be attacked while they were in the water. <laughs> the Abenaki said, hey, come on over here, guys. <laughs> the Iroquois said, no, you come over here, ho. Hey, um, no paiwi nidali ombanakiak kadopi dit. After a time had passed, the Abenaki began to feel kind of hungry. They hadn't had any breakfast, I guess. Agamo mitsi manhak wongana udzi kawak. And there they saw pine trees before them, and the inner bark of the pine is good to eat. So manhak wonganak agamo mitsi. So they took some of that inner bark and began to chew it and eat it. It tasted good. They felt revived and energized. Ilakwak namito yo taida kia radarondak. From the other side, the Iroquois people said, oh, you guys are porcupines, bark eaters, radarondak. So, Nick Wombi, Ilakwak, liwihlon ombanakiak adarondak alnombak. And so it was that from that Iroquois word, the name Adirondack came to be. And often the Haudenosaunee would call the Abenakis the Adirondack Indians, a name that came down to this day, the bark eaters. So, kanwa ombanakiak ida onzidawi kia ibita maguak. Huh. Well, you people, 
You are timid people, afraid to come over here and fight us. That's who you are. Right. You are Magwak, Mohawk, timid people. Ibitan Nekwombi, Ombanakiak, Liwihlon, Ilakwak, Magwak. And so it is that the name Magwak is the word that we say for the Iroquois people among our Abenaki people. That's right. Nialats. And that's the end of the story. Satisfied in their battle of insults, each side went home. <laughs> The gastoe, which is an Iroquois word for the, the head covering, and actually these are used by both uh, Haudenosaunee and uh, Abenaki people. If this were a Haudenosaunee gastoe, uh, the number of feathers and the way they were on top of the bonnet would indicate what particular of the five nations or six nations you were from, but the way our feathers are arranged indicate that we're not Iroquois. <laughs> mm -hmm. In fact, uh, in Abenaki, you would say, Asol kun idamo yo. Uh, it's called a hat, Asol Kun. Asol Literally, Kun. an arch. Asol Kun, the arch, is what this hat is called, mm -hmm. Asol Kun. And you can see on Jesse's uh, silver work, which has the arch on it, you can see on mine beadwork, which has that same arch, which may stand for the sky arch, mm -hmm. or it may stand for the arch of the wigwam, that home which we live in, which could be in the shape of a, a dome or a teepee shape. And so the wigwam simply means a house. But what I was saying is that uh, we didn't have guitars when we were gastoways, so getting this over your head is not an easy thing to do. And uh, this is also a hollow object. Ombak tahigan. Ombak tahigan, which literally means... Uh, it, it has music in it. It contains music in it. That <laughs> word is also used for the radio Sorry. and the television. <laughs> and the guitar, all of which are new objects. One thing about the Abenaki language, you could always make up a new word that would describe what you were seeing. So if it was something you'd not seen before, like this object on my wrist, those clocks did not occur. So the words in Abenaki that were used to make a new word. Tabaiki uh, zosongana, actually nidali is tabaiki zosongana kawa lagia digana, one word. It means tabai, to divide or to measure. Tabakunim is to measure. Tabakuna, measure someone. Uh, kizos is the sun. Tabai kizos, it measures the sun. Ongan means the tool. Tabai kizos ongan, the tool that measures the sun. Onkawa means it is linked. Uh, onkawa lagi adiganal means it is linked around your wrist. So it has a, a watch so, with a watch band. Um, Again, the, say the whole, the whole word. Tabai kizos ongan onkawa lagi adiganal. Now 48, else. 48 letter <laughs> word. <laughs> Very descriptive language, though. It's that thing which divides the day, which is connected to your wrist. <laughs> yeah. And thinking of dividing the day, um, the Mohegan language is very similar to our language. You can translate pretty easily from one to the other. And about a hundred years ago, there was an elderly Mohegan woman named Jitz Budunako, which would be Sips uh, Budunako, right. flying bird, right. uh, in Abenaki who kept a journal in the Mohegan language. It was just a really beautiful, simple little journal. And what she wrote in it uh, were things like, uh, wigo, God is good. Simple as that. Or she'd say, Niayo, it is so. Or she'd say things like, today I was able to get up. God is good. <laughs> today I was able to eat. God is good. <laughs> so giving thanks for those simple things. So this is a little song that I created after having translated her journal, and uh, I decided to write a song which uh, repeats her words. It's called Niayo. Sun comes up another day. Niayo, it is so. I give thanks for its light. Niayo, it is so. Niayo, Niayo. Niayo, it is so. 
Niyayo, niyayo, niyayo it is so. I give thanks that I can stand. Niyayo, it is so. For all the blessings of our land. Niyayo, it is so. Niyayo, niyayo. Niyayo, it is so. Niyayo, niyayo. God is good, gives much to me. Niyayo, it is so. All is good that I can see. Niyayo, it is so. Niyayo, niyayo. Niyayo, it is so. Niyayo, niyayo. Niyayo, it is so. Mundu gives to me my breath. Niyayo, it is so. Mundo gives to me my strength. Niyayo, it is so. Niyayo, niyayo. Niyayo, it is so. Niyayo, niyayo. Niyayo. Nothing will I fear at night. Niayo, it is so. The sun rises in my heart. Niayo, it is so. Niayo, niayo. Niyayo, it is so. Niyayo, niyayo. Niyayo, it is so. Niyayo, niyayo. Niyayo, it is so. going to make me try and get this over my that's easier thank you all right <laughs> we're gonna do one more that we have the guitar out and over augustoe aso konal yolen tongan udzi nimeto kusna this is a song for our father, and it's one of the first things that was translated. In about 1630, a man named John Eliot um, was in Massachusetts and going around from one native community to another and translating into those native languages the Bible. And the Lord's Prayer was one thing that was uh, translated at that time as well in dozens of dialects. And these documents are wonderful to look back on for languages that have been lost. And one of the first things I actually learned from Cecile 
uh, while in Olet, my teacher in the language was the Lord's Prayer, and I immediately put it to song. As I, I'm doing now when I teach the language for others, I also learn really well with song. So this is, uh, this is the Lord's Prayer, al uh, in the Abenaki language for you. And as you'll hear, some of the words in it, we talked about how descriptive the language is, even though it's translated, and John Eliot was translating into Abenaki, the Bible, the meanings when you translate languages are not always uh, directly correlated one to one. Uh, they're not exactly the same. There are some funny examples of this about how things just don't relate. Uh, one example is uh, the idea of extreme extreme unction or extreme unction, uh, a practice that is done before someone is dead to put a, a holy oil on their head became awasos bemi in the Bible, which literally means to give somebody bear grease. There's Which actually a, a story a nice about gift. that. There's a story about an elderly chief who had never converted to Catholicism, although his wife was Catholic. And so when he was literally on his deathbed, he finally said to his wife, um, all right, if, if you want me to, to go to the happy place, even though the French will be there, uh, I'll agree to convert right now. That was what was his problem. He said, if the French are there, I'm not going there. But So she ran to get the priest, and the priest was so excited, he ran to the house and uh, saw the old man was really badly off, so he immediately took out his vial and began to give him extreme unction. And the old man said very weakly, you know, oh, 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 meaning, what, what, what's going on? And, and the priest, who was proud of his ability to speak the language, said, oh, I'm giving you awasos bimal, I'm giving you bear grease, extreme unction. And the old man sat up and grabbed the, the bottle and said, oh, I haven't had any bear grease in a long time. Thank you so much, my friend. My wife, our friend, has given me bear grease. Let's have food for him. He got up out of bed, didn't die that day, um, was saved by a gift of bear grease. <laughs> anyway, back to the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> it's, and it's true of a lot of things in the language. The, uh, the idea of... Um, the Lord itself is expressed in some in some fun ways, and this is Songmawal Megwadets, which literally means "He who is like a sky chief," mm -hmm. uh, which is a pretty beautiful translation. You'll hear that in the song. So the Lord's Prayer, Al Nombaiwe. Nemitoku sina, spem ki kayan, Songmawal Megwadets, Aluizian. Amanta Patsi Wow Itoak Keti Baldam Wawa Wonganek Nemitoko Sena Our Father Nemitoko Sena Our Father Nemitoko Sena Spemki Gaya In the Skyland Thou Art Aleki kutogwak Kete laudam wongan Spem kik tali Aloezian Ionobi Ionobi Daleki kali kik tongwadets Nemetoko sena, our father. Nemetoko sena, our father. Nemetoko our sena, spem ki gaya. In the skyland, thou art. Nemetoko sena, our father. Nemetoko sena, our father. Nemetoko sena, spem ki gaya. In the skyland, thou art. When you open the circle, you then have to close it. So we're going to do a closing song and then answer some questions after that. So if you have questions, keep them in mind. We'll be glad to try to answer them. And uh, I should point out that on that table over there, we have some flyers are about our uh, Saratoga Native Festival, October 1st and 2nd, where we'll have uh, music, storytelling, traditional arts and crafts, and 
a lot of educational information for children and for adults both, because we really feel that one of our jobs on this earth is to pass it on to the next generation so that we can see that circle continue and stay strong. It's one of the great responsibilities that this place, the Visitors Interpretive Center, and the generosity of Paul Smith's has made possible. So I'm glad to be in this very sacred and special place today and very honored to be part of this series that was put together by the uh, Adirondack Writing Center. I'd like to give great thanks to Natalie and her good work in doing this. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and thanks to Christian, too. <laughs> Uh, this is a closing song, and it is actually from our relatives. This circle that my dad talks about connects us to many different people, and the language of Abenaki is very, very closely related. In fact, a part of that language which is spoken by those people in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, we know as the Mi'kmaq or Mi'kmaq people. I was just at a Wabanaki Writers Alliance in Maine for a week teaching youth to be writers, all Abenaki from Passamaquoddy, um, Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet communities, other Abenaki communities of Maine. This was written by Roger Paul, one of the instructors there's uncle. His name is George <coughs> Paul. And it sings for what my dad said for that community to um, come together and to share all the things we have. It sings for the health of the community, the health of that circle of relations of which we're all a part. So this is that song. And you'll notice, perhaps, because now you all know so much Abenaki um, <laughs> from today, or uh, uh, that you'll notice that this dialect is slightly different as I sing the song. It is uh, in the Mi'kmaq dialect. Hipne de Jigwede Don't tell the no de Jigamasku Hemawidani Hipne de jigwade, a win of exode, jigga masku. Hey, a bone of my duke digging it. Hey, a bone of my duke digging it. Stop, kiss to deli balu, say hey, bola sisqualu. Hey, yeah, hey, yo. Away, oh, hey, hi, hi, away, oh, hey, oh, hey, hi, away, oh, hey, hi, hi, away, oh, hey, hi, away, oh, hey, hi, away, oh, hey, hi, hi, away, oh, hey, hi, away, oh, hey, hi, hi, away, oh, hey, oh, Thank you. Uliuni. Uliuni Nitova. Thank you, my friends. Questions? I would like to know what other uh, tribes belong to the uh, Algonquin. I did not know that the uh, Abenakis were part of the Algonquin. Mm -hmm. Well, Eastern Algonquin specifically um, includes all the way down to the Powhatan people in Virginia, the uh, Jamestown colony, um, and then all the way up into Cree and Montagnier country in Canada. So the, and basically much of the Northeast would be considered Eastern Algonquin. But Algonquin itself goes all the way out West and includes even the Cheyenne people. Um, so it is an enormous family. The language family was om perhaps some think was almost 80%. It may be as small as 60, but still a majority of languages were Algonquin on contact. In North America. In North America. Um, However, most of these Algonquin languages were in the Northeast, and the Northeast was one of the hardest hit by epidemics. And so a large loss of population meant that there are many, many languages and many communities you may have never heard of because those mm -hmm. communities were uh, completely decimated by contact. But Within so, 50 years of first contact, at least 90% of the population of the Northeast was exterminated. Yeah. Uh, some people you would know, though, of course, are the Wampanoag. 
Um, Squanto, uh, um, Squantum, was from the Wampanoag people who, who met the pilgrims, and that is in Massachusetts. Wampanoag is the same word as Wombanaki. You hear that it is just a different way. It's a slightly different dialect um, of, of Eastern Algonquin. Anytime you see in New England a uh, word that ends with K-I or A-G, that means earth or land or place. Mm-hmm throughout all of New England. Uh, more specifically, what we would call a Beneke or Abenaki uh, would be part of the Wabanaki Confederacy. These are very closely related people. Western of Beneke, and that would be the people of originally of Vermont, the Adirondack Mountain region, uh, into New Hampshire. And there were maybe 13 different tribal entities that we now call Western of Beneke. They all kind of coalesced together. Including, most famously, Mohicans. Uh, who were also part of that uh, as well. Yeah, Sokoki um, was a band. Uh, Pakumtuk, pa, what are some other? Missisquoi. Temp- Missisquoi. There's just a lot of them that were all became Western or Beneke. Then slightly further to the east, you have Penobscot, speaking virtually the same language, virtually the same culture. Then Passamaquoddy, a little bit more different. Then Maliseet and Micmac. And those tribal nations all make up the Wabanaki and the Wabanaki Confederacy, which was an organization of these uh, Eastern Algonquin people during the period uh, following the first appearance of colonialism. They formed a very uh, solid confederacy and even included some Mohawk communities as part of the Wabanaki Confederacy. Mm -hmm. So that's a long answer to your short question. (laughs) There are many, many smaller tribal groups so that we did not mention. And as I remember, uh, we were taught that the Algonquin were the peaceful tribes that made bricks by the Hudson River, Mm -hmm. and the Iroquois Confederacy would constantly come. They were warlike, and they would come and fight with them. Is that this, is this? That's a typical simplification of history, saying the Iroquois were warlike and the Algonquin people were peaceful. I think it really, it does sort of give a, uh, a view that's often colored by people interpreting things. Uh, their own way. I think each group had its own possibilities for war or peace, just like all human beings have within us what my Haudenosaunee friends call the good mind and the twisted mind. You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can be thinking, and what, think what you're thinking right now. Is it good mind or twisted mind? And see if you can change your mind. Uh, and I think that's true, that the Haudenosaunee people certainly did engage in warfare to enlarge their confederacy. But their confederacy was supposedly a league of peace, and peace was one of the most important aspects of, and still is one of the most important aspects of Haudenosaunee or Iroquois culture, the idea of peace. And that the uh, Beneke or the Mohegan or the others were totally peaceful is not exactly true either. Mm-hmm. I think that you really have to look at human beings as human beings and each culture in its own light to make the, the proper uh, deliberation about what they were and who they were and avoid that kind of simplification a lot of us got in school. You know, as kids, none of us ever wanted to be Indians. We all wanted to be cowboys because the cowboys always won. (laughs) John Wayne could shoot his gun and four Indians would fall off their horse. (laughs) Of course, the reason for that was that when you're an Indian stuntman in Hollywood, this is true, you got paid more for falling off your horse than staying on it. So I heard this story from Jim Thorpe's son that one day his father was working on a film and they weren't paying the Indian stuntmen enough. And they said, okay, what do we get if we fall off a horse? Okay, an extra $25. So one cowboy shoots a gun, every Indian falls off his horse. (laughs) Great story. Other questions? Is it Abenaki or Abenaki? It's both. Yeah. Well, in the language, it's it's much closer to Abenaki. So I think when when you speak with people who have spoken the language or are familiar with it, they're going to start saying aben, aki, because it's two words, aben, which is dawn, and aki. Or light or white. Which is land. So, or earth or place. Yeah. So aben, aki is, is much more close to the language. But everybody, I mean, you'll hear abernaki. In Vermont in particular. You, you'll hear um, <coughs> abnaki, just abnaki. You'll hear that in New Hampshire and, and places. And Abenaki is common here. They're all fine. Uh, they're all fine. But closest to the way you'd say it in the language is, is Abenaki. Abenaki. Mm-hmm. And there were regional differences, too. And I often think that many of the differences in the way we speak English is a result of a tribal dialect that was spoken before. I sometimes think, you know, maybe the Brooklyn Indians had that accent. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and certainly the Massachusetts. The Boston, Indians. yeah. The, 
The there's, Boston there's, accent. There's no R. In any, there's no R in uh, most Eastern Algonquin languages, so hence Boston. Boston. It's where all their R's went. Yeah, we always have a, a box full of R's we give to our Wampanoag friends when they visit us here. Right. You need these. Take them home with you. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely early, as I said, um, it was first. In terms of European contact, yeah, it was for it was after contact. There was only limited writing, um, pictographic type writing on birch bark and on rock, of course, and we see that. And story could be recorded in that way, but it was not a full writing system. There was an orthography created in about 1630 by Eliot. Abenakis, though, then were immediately being educated at two colleges, which were founded for native people: Harvard and Dartmouth. And at a certain point in Boston, the native Wampanoag community was more literate than the white community because mm -hmm. so many native kids were, were being educated because they thought that was the way to do it. It's a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, both Harvard and Dartmouth quickly forgot their charters yes. and have only recently gone back to having real great native programs, which they do have. Again, they're very supportive of the work I do. I'm at both schools a couple times each year doing things. So. Interesting point of history. Dartmouth College was founded with money raised by Samson Ockham a Mohegan Indian preacher who went to England and preached all over England raising money to found a college for Indians. Dartmouth College, founded by Eliezer Wheelock, his mentor, who then made it into a college primarily for young white men. But the money came from Samson Ockham's preaching in England, in English, a Mohegan minister. Several graduates from Dartmouth, though, did create orthographies and wonderful resources. Um, from, from 18, in 1830 was Okalayin, uh, born in the Adirondacks as a Zonkarin. And then he uh, w went to Dartmouth. <coughs> he was a Dartmouth boy and went back to Odenac, the reserve my father mentioned in Quebec, founded the Protestant church there, uh, translated the Gospel of Mark into Abenaki, and wrote some wonderful books of traditional stories in 1830. They are only in the Abenaki language. I'm in the process of translating them for the first time into English. They represent the earliest recorded Native American stories from North America um, at, in 1830. And most of them have never, as a, most people have never had a chance to read them or access them because you'd have to speak Abenaki to do that. Um, and then several other chiefs throughout um, the last 200, 250 years have written and others have written in the language and all That's these resources. Yeah. Abenaki people were extremely uh, prolific. So my father's following in a long line of that. And it showed to me that these people were really, really um, believing that we needed to maintain our language even as early on as 1830. Wazel Klein was doing everything he could to translate things into Abenaki, which is wonderful to see that so early on. Many Native people didn't have a written language. Even in Maine, the Passamaquoddy developed a written language, relatives of ours, close relatives, in 1980. So you see that the Western Abenaki dialect uh, was, it's different for every language. Many languages had uh, no written, la written uh, version until recently. But what it means is that in 1830, the language was recorded, therefore we have a resource that can tell us how we spoke the language 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. And many native nations do not have that. In many cases, the languages they still speak have been affected by English or have in some cases been lost, if not entirely, then in part. So we're really fortunate there is so much. You had a question, sir, with the blue shirt. What was the population, the native population before contact? You know, it's really interesting because um, there's a lot of different controversial work written about this. Some people talk about populations in the hundreds of thousands or even the millions in the Northeast. And a number of years ago, Jesse was researching the uh, Jesuit relations. Mm -hmm. You may remember this, and he and I were talking about this. And uh, the Jesuits were doing censuses of villages and only counting the men of uh, you know mature age, men who were full grown. And the further west they went away from the settlements, the more and more they found, and they were finding villages of tens of thousands of people, just counting the men alone. And this was in the 1600s, after some of the plagues that occurred on the New England coast. And a friend of mine um, named Steve Lewandowski, who is an agronomist and also a really fine poet, uh, did some studies of Niagara County in terms of carrying capacity of the soil and looking at the way corn was grown from all the records in the early period of European contact. And he concluded from all of that that the population of Niagara County in New York State was the same prior to contact of Europeans as it is as it was in 1980. 
the land had the carrying capacity for that many people, and there was evidence that there were that many people there. So I think that the population of North America was once estimated at a million and a half people prior to contact. We now know that's a very, very low number, at least 20 or 30 million, and probably many more than that, and in Mexico alone, huge populations, which again were terribly decimated by European diseases. Uh, I'm talking about in terms of uh, North America, north of the Mexican border. But if you go south of the Mexican border, the populations there are very large. And to this day, there are millions, there are millions of Mayan Indians in Mexico alone, mm -hmm. much less Guatemala, Belize, and other parts of Central and South America where there's large native populations. Population is sometimes used as a justification. But in fact, to be honest, it would not matter how many there are. We need to respect each person and each nation. To judge the importance of a people by their numbers is like judging the importance of a person by their height. It's not through height that we see the moon. We can all look to the stars. Right here in front. Yeah, um, were, there, were there any permanent uh, villages in the Adirondacks, the Algonquin peoples? Or that's a great question. The Adirondacks mostly for passing through, hunting. And That's a great question. I, it was definitely used for hunting. We have a friend who we just saw recently who really wants to do some uh, some more research into that because it's an open-ended question. We don't know. What I think was obviously true is that there were people who lived here year-round. Mm -hmm. There were people who could hunt, fish, could gather, could survive year-round. A little difficult, those of us who live in the Adirondacks know, I mean, we used to say, you know, the storytelling season is between first frost and last frost, which means we can't tell stories on August 15th. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> be that as it may, um, there's very strong evidence that people had seasonal habitation. We sometimes judge people by modern standards, mm -hmm. where you live in one house 12 months of the year. But most indigenous people in many parts of the world traveled throughout the seasons. And they would have a summer residence and a winter residence, depending on what was available at that time. So seasonal patterns of residence, I think, took in the Adirondacks. So people had places they came back to every year, and which were their homes. Just their home stretched over hundreds of square miles, not just a little backyard. And I would honestly say that that story, that story of San Halonuk about the Iroquois and the uh, Abenaki meeting there, had to have been an event that happened more than once, and it might have likely been a, an area of demarcation between hunting territories for people, but I think it really shows that, that knowledge of each other being right around the Saranac Lake region. One more question? One over here. Let's take this one first, and then you. Go ahead. I, too, was educated in New York State, but I don't remember exactly what I learned all those years ago, but I wonder now how much are non-native children educated about the native people of, you know, historically in the state and, and the ones who still live here? Somewhat better. Uh, it's better. But I can tell you a good friend of mine, uh, John Cajones Fadden, who was, uh, who was the Six Nations Indian Museum. His son David just did a program for this series. Um, John and myself, and a, myself peripherally, and a lot of Iroquois people were involved in trying to help revise and update the state syllabus for teaching in elementary schools. And their suggestions were turned down about 15 or 20 years ago. Um, although some of it has been implemented, there's still a long way to go. Things are better, but they're not where they should be. And I was, it's kind of related to my question, which is, um, do you think that overall Native Americans are portrayed better in the media and in public life than they used to be, or is it more or less the same as it always has been? Jess, you want to say something like that? I think things have improved, mm -hmm. clearly. I mean, I, I think there are still a lot of struggles that people don't understand. And I think there's a lot of healing that needs to happen now within Native communities, too. And I think there's a lot of Every community is different. You know, I think that's one of the most complex things for us to understand about any people. Not only are there cultures, there are many different cultures among Native people, it's not just one people. And I think that's where we are now is that time when we can not only see uh, Native people in a better light, but also see the diversity 
among Native people and among Native histories. I talked about that with literature, as Abenakis being uh, uh, people who were writing, Western Abenakis very, on, very early on, while others maybe were not. Some people are still living in states of great poverty. Um, when we go the further north and the further south we go, we seem to find very, uh, very uh, great hardships still continuing mm -hmm. to this day among Native people. Yeah, I often, when I go to Pine Ridge, I have friends there, Pine Ridge Reservation in Oak, South Dakota, mm -hmm. has the highest level of poverty, unemployment, fetal alcohol syndrome, the list goes on, teenage suicide of any community in the United States. It really is like a ghetto on the prairie or, or in the Badlands. So I think that uh, we have a long way to go. We have to, again, see each other as individuals and recognize the differences between communities yeah. while respecting each other. Respect is a really important thing, whatever we do. Uh, there was one more question up there, did you? Great. Okay, good.